Professor Newland is an American law and economics professor currently serving as Swanland Chair Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Professor Newland received a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College, a master's from St. Catherine's College, Oxford, and a PhD in economics from Stanford University. In addition, he was a research affiliate of the Environmental Council, a member of the campus honors faculty, and held several positions in the Department of Economics and the Institute for, of, for Government and Public Affairs. We are honored to have Professor Yulin with us for this particular workshop. Now, if I may, may please request uh, Professor Thomas Yulin, sir, to begin with today's second session. A warm welcome, Professor. You are you are muted. You are muted, Professor. Oh, good morning. It's morning here. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Good evening to you all. Uh, I uh, see that there are a lot of people joining us, uh, and so congratulations, Hitesh. Congratulations, Renita. You've got a, a large group of people, and I I, uh, I look forward to, to interacting with you every day this week. Uh, from Monday through Friday. Uh, Hitesh, I've got some uh, slides Professor, to present. Professor Ulan, just one, you know, one, one intervention. Yeah. Uh, all this has, all this has been possible thanks to, um, you know, your, your handholding through the entire exercise over the last eight years. So the credit goes to you. Thank you. You're certainly welcome, and thank you for uh, all the many opportunities you've given me to interact with uh, you and your colleagues. It's been a joy. Um, I have, uh, uh, I usually do exactly what uh, Professor Nagar tells me to do. Uh, I found that to be a very sound uh, way to proceed. Uh, I am going to give you five lectures uh, this week. Uh, and it's a sort of an introduction of uh, the basic law and economics course. Um, and I have to say this to you, um, what I call a basic course has changed very much in the many years since I've been teaching this. I started teaching this in an economics department in 1980. Many of you probably were not born uh, then. Uh, but one of the things that I have discovered is that this field has attracted a, a, a very large number of incredibly talented people. Uh, and as a result, there have been people all over the world working in this area uh, and trying to extend our understanding, uh, use, uh, develop new applications of law and economics to, to practical problems uh, and doing fascinating empirical research to see whether some of the propositions of, of basic law and economics are borne out by a confrontation with reality. Um, it's, uh, so the basic course that I'm going to teach you is going to, to be a little bit different than it would have been 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago. Uh, I hope uh, I will be able to share my slides with you as I proceed. Is that is that okay, Hitesh? Can I share my slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna try that right now. Don't need that. Thank you. Play from the start. Okay. Here I go. I'm getting there. I have to. I have to change my system preferences. Apparently, Let's see.
Okay, Hitesh, it says that I have to leave the meeting to share my video, so I'm not going to do that. I, I just, I hope that, uh, let me see. I hope you can do this for me. We'll see. Let me see if this works. Uh, no, it's not letting me do that. Anyway, I hope you have my syllabus and uh, the such as you have to go to share and then screen one automatically it will share uh, it says open system preferences to allow webex to share your content i did that uh, so that should work should i should i share we have of you yeah that would be wonderful if you would thank you yeah, yeah. Today, uh, uh, my purpose is to, and just let me know, Hitesh, when, when we're ready to go. Uh, today, my purpose is to give you a basic introduction to the course and to tell you what I'm going to be talking about the rest of the week. Uh, trying to get all of this uh, in one hour uh, and before your questions uh, is going to be a challenge. Uh, but I, I know that uh, Hitesh and Ranita will share this PowerPoint and the materials with you, uh, and you can read those or look at them yourselves. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. On the syllabus, I put my email address. So uh, can you send me the PowerPoint? Because I have your uh, PDF file, not PowerPoint. Okay. Well, darn it. It says that I've got uh, got uh, access to Cisco WebEx events and meetings, but I don't know if that that's going to work. Whether you're sharing to Anita, madam, your PPT? Uh, yes, yes, I just sent it to you. I'll just send it to me, madam. Just in two minutes, we can start. Oh, good. I'll, after the meeting, Hitesh, I'll restart the uh, uh, Cisco WebEx so that it will recognize my, uh, my ability to share. That's the problem. This, I will share it. I think Matt, uh, Ranita, Madam, is sharing me. I will just share it in one minute. Okay. Well, let me, let me proceed to just talk while you do this today i'm going to talk about three things uh, i'm going to talk about some basic tools that you need to do law and economics i know you know ex these but I'll, I'll go through them very quickly then i want to do, do very briefly a discussion of law and social norms i'll explain to you when we get to that part of the uh uh, of the lecture, why I think that's important for you to know that as a basic tool uh, of law and economics. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk very briefly about the limits to markets. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues I always faced when I was teaching at the law school at the University of Illinois uh, was that my students I uh, always thought that because I was uh, originally trained as an economist, I thought that markets were the answer to any question, any question at all. Uh, and so when I, uh, after many years of teaching, decided to include this section on uh, the limits to markets, uh, I, was, I was amazed. Uh, the, 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 when I ask them questions like the ones you're going to see, uh, they would think, oh, my goodness, he, the, the, he's, he's trying to trick us. Uh, he, he's an economist, therefore, he thinks markets work for absolutely any social problem. Uh, but as you will see, there are limits. 
Tomorrow we'll talk about property law and economics. Wednesday we'll talk about tort law and economics. Uh, Thursday we'll talk about criminal law and economics. And then on Friday we're going to try to do everything else in one hour. Uh, legal institutions, the future of law and economics, behavioral law and economics, and empirical law and economics. If I can get through all of that in one hour, uh, it will be uh, news that should be spread around the world. That's that's a lot of material to get through, but I hope uh, I hope you'll bear with me and and get to the bitter end. Okay, here we go. I don't know if the, the slideshow is up yet or not. Were you able to get it up, uh, Hitesh? Okay. Yes, you... One to me, sir, but you can start, sir. I'm just doing that. So, which slide should I put in? Introduction to Law and Economics? That first? The first one, the first one, lecture, the first lecture. It's title, lecture one. The first one I sent to you, sir. Oh, there, are, there are four, six slides at the moment. The first one that I sent to you. Yeah, some of them are in PowerPoint, some of them are PDF. <clears throat> I have a friend who says, you, you know very well that uh, PDF stands for portable document format, but I have a friend who says that PDF stands for pretty darn frustrating. There we go. That's it. Thank you so much. Now, can I advance those, Hitesh, or will you, you advance those? Uh, Hitesh, will, Hitesh will handle it, sir, because, okay. yes. Okay, I'm going to go quickly through these, Hitesh. Yes. Uh, the first thing I want to bring to your attention is the central premise of law and economics. Uh, and that is that microeconomics, which is the study of how people make decisions about all sorts of things, uh, is the tool of economics that we're going to use. I will say as a parenthetical remark that to my knowledge, there is only one uh, significant piece of scholarship uh, uh, using macroeconomics to look at law and economics. Uh, and that's the work of Yair Listikin, who's a professor at Yale uh, Law School. Uh, I, I commend his book, uh, Law and Macroeconomics, to you. It's excellent. Um, I'm going to go through a few, not all of the, the ones that are in the original slideshow, but just a couple of the tools from economics that I think you, you will find useful uh, in talking uh, ab about the law uh, from an economic standpoint. One of the first things to recognize is that uh, economics, uh, like many social scientists, uh, sciences, recognizes an important difference between positive and normative aspects of our discipline. Uh, the, the distinction is an important one for us to remember as we go forward. Positive aspects refer basically uh, to descriptive uh, uh, act, uh, actions. Uh, if we're interested in, ex in using economics to explore the positive aspects of legal issues, we're principally interested in knowing how people are likely to behave. These are hypotheses. Uh, about how people behave, not a discussion about how they ought to behave, but how, in fact, they do behave. Uh, because economics is such a, a, an important and powerful tool for talking about how people be, uh, behave uh, and make decisions, it's, it's uh, extremely useful in the study of the law, where we, we craft rules and standards designed to channel people's behavior into uh, uh, socially desirable uh, ends. The other aspect of economics that I want to also call to your attention are the normative aspects. These are not what the law is, is actually trying to do or what, how people actually behave. 
it's a discussion of our aspirations and our goals. How should the laws be written to enforce the social goals that we articulate? How should they be enforced? Uh, how should they be, uh, how should people be sanctioned or punished uh, if they don't behave? Okay, next slide. Uh, another part of, of central economics is this very important phrase, people respond to incentives. Uh, that's a bedrock assumption of economics. Uh, because law is a method of ordering society uh, to further social goals, laws seek to influence people's behavior. Uh, and, and the way we do that is articulate rules and standards that uh, cause people to behave in the way we want them to behave. We're trying to create incentives for them to do things that we, we as lawmakers wish that they would behave. We can also uh, facilitate how people and groups uh, uh, ought to behave. Uh, corporations, other business associations are groups uh, and we can influence how those groups make decisions by making the rules of business associations, including corporations, uh, have a particular flavor. Uh, a second uh, assumption slide, uh, to put this into practice, I'm going to make this very obvious point. If, if we want to discourage an activity, we raise the price. I'm putting price in quotation marks because very rarely do we actually include a, a, a specific price uh, for performing a, in a particular way in the law. But implicitly, laws create prices or penalties uh, for uh, not doing something that we want people to do uh, or for failing to do things that we do want them uh, to do. So uh, economics is useful in, in providing a framework for seeing how people are likely to respond uh, to the legal implications. A third assumption that I want to bring to your attention. Next slide, uh, Hitesh. And that's that we're going to be looking at legal uh, actions from what is called the ex ante perspective. The ex ante perspective is the perspective that here we articulate a law uh, and we want to know how people are going to behave. That's to be contrasted with the ex post perspective in which we're eager to see how people behave, did behave in, in regard to the law. I have found in my many years of working at the law school that uh, lawyers tend to focus on when things go wrong. Uh, they, they learn the law by looking at cases. Uh, a, a legal dispute is by and large an, an admission that something didn't work right, that somebody did not behave according to the rules uh, that we, we hoped they would behave. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing things that way, with looking at, the, at law from the ex post per perspective, that is looking at litigation to try to understand what, what went right and what went wrong. But economists tend to focus on what's called the ex ante perspective. Here are the rules. How are people behaving uh, with regard to those rules? Uh, embedded in this is a sort of perception that uh, if, um, um, if people are behaving according to the rules, there aren't going to be very many legal disputes. And in point of fact, it's worth remembering that in the United States, at least, empirical uh, studies have shown uh, that uh, legal disputes account for a very, very small uh, amount of human interaction. Uh, we believe that legal disputes account for only two to 3% uh, of, of interactions that uh, people engage in. That is the vast majority of people try to inform themselves about what the law is and then conform their behavior to it. Two last assumptions. We assume that uh, legal institutions, the market for lawyers, the courts, the, the police, the prosecutors, all of the instruments of legal uh, enforcement are working well. 
uh, and there's there's no or very little corruption, uh, and and the, uh, the the courts can enforce the law as it's written uh, at relatively low cost. And this is a tremendously important assumption that I'm going to relax uh, later in the week. And that is, with the, uh, we assume that we are dealing with rational decision makers, that everybody involved in the legal process is rational. Now, as you know, when economists say that people are rational, uh, they don't mean that they're uh, chess grandmasters. What they mean is that people can identify their the things that give them pleasure and the things that give them pain. Uh, they can assess their duties under the law. Uh, they can they can tease out the prices embedded in the in law, uh, and they can conform their behavior so as to make themselves just as happy as they can possibly be uh, when complying with the uh, the prices that the legal system uh, places on different kinds of behavior. Okay, tool number one, and I'm only going to go through two. I'm not going to go through all three of these in the interest of time. Tool number one that uh, is tremendously important uh, is transaction costs. Transaction costs are a uh, uh, an aspect of the market economy that we we economists didn't pay attention to until really the 1960s. Uh, and the reason we pay attention to it is because of the work of a Nobel Prize winning economist, Ronald Coase, who said uh, in the 1930s, and it took 30 years for this to, to really work its way into the toolkit of most economists. Ronald Coase said, you know, we're implicitly assuming that affecting, effectuating a market exchange uh, implies that there are no transaction costs, that you know who to deal with, that you don't have to negotiate with them, and after you've negotiated with them uh, about a price, uh, there are no monitoring or enforcement costs. So what? It's a it's a simple but extraordinarily powerful uh, observation by Professor Coase. Uh, there are three elements to transaction costs. In any transaction, the search costs, finding somebody with whom to deal, the negotiation or bargaining costs, bargaining with them about terms and conditions of the transaction. When will it be completed? Uh, how much is this going to cost? No, that's too much. I don't want to pay that. Uh, and uh, when will delivery uh, take place? And then, and then the third element are the monitoring or enforcement costs. Sometimes transactions take a long time to complete and there have to be costs incurred in monitoring whether people are behaving in this period of time uh, in the way that you hope that they would. A complex transaction like building a house, uh, building an apartment complex takes time uh, and the monitoring and enforcement costs uh, of making sure that things are arriving and being uh, constructed in a timely fashion are very important. The point to realize is not that transaction costs are always high or always zero. They can be any level at all. And uh, in, in talking about market exchange, all we're saying is, all Professor Coase asks us to remember is, when they're low, when transaction costs are low, markets, that is private bargaining, uh, is going to to work. Uh, we go, <clears throat> excuse me. We can rely on bargaining uh, to achieve the allocation of goods to their highest valued use. But in those circumstances where transaction costs are high, uh, then private bargaining may fail. Uh, people may not find a way to surmount the transaction costs. In that case. Uh, law can perform the function of reducing transaction costs for people. And in fact, I'll make this statement uh, and I'll try to illustrate at various points this week. Uh, one of the most fascinating things that, that law and economics has discovered is that at least in the area of contract law, but in other areas too, one of the principal things that the law does is reduce transaction costs so that people can engage in exchange uh, that, that benefits all the parties involved. 
uh, we'll, I'll try to indicate how we do that in, in some uh, important uh, examples. So the, the key takeaway is be aware of the transaction costs in any, in any circumstance. Uh, let me give one or two, uh, I'll just give you one. Uh, well, no, I'll give you two uh, short examples. Uh, if you would like to have a Coca-Cola light, as it's called in Europe, or a Diet Coke, as it's called in the United States, a Coca-Cola that has no calories. The transaction costs in finding and consuming uh, a, a Diet Coke are almost zero. They're available everywhere, <clears throat> or a close substitute is available almost anywhere. You don't have to bargain about the price. Uh, it's, it's trivial, uh, and there are no enforcement or monitoring costs. There can be, of course, if the Coke is not what you thought you, you received. But in general, uh, that's an instantaneous transaction. It doesn't take time to complete. Uh, and there's no haggling about price. And the monitoring and enforcement costs are zero. It's, it's a, a good example of uh, very low transaction costs. Um, what fact, oh, the other example I wanted to point out to you is a real life example. Uh, I'll pay you not to smoke. Uh, I was once at a conference in Sweden with uh, the great, uh, 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 a great group of people, including a very distinguished uh, uh, English law and economics specialist. Uh, and uh, he said to me before the meal began, uh, I hope none of you will smoke. Uh, during the meal because it tends to affect the way I, I taste the food. And of course, we all said, oh, absolutely, we won't do that. But then I noticed uh, that there was there were two couples at the table behind us in the restaurant, and three of them were smoking cigarettes. And I said to Tony, uh, I said, Tony, why don't you turn around and, and ask those people uh, how much money they would be willing to accept not to smoke uh, while we're uh, uh, eating. Now, here the transaction costs are not zero. They're not trivial at all. These people might be offended. Uh, they might get angry. Uh, they might cause a, a scene. Uh, but nonetheless, Tony, bless his heart, uh, turned around. And here's what he said. It's very important the way he put this. We're doing an experiment at the table here. I wonder if I could ask you not to smoke while we're here. They all said, of course, we'll be happy not to smoke. And they put out their cigarettes and both parties were better off. I think the key thing that Tony said in this transaction was, we're doing an experiment here. That sounds as if this is a serious undertaking. I'm not just asking this, uh, and, uh, in a casual way. This is part of, of academic research. Uh, and that made the people more likely to concede with virtually zero transaction costs. They didn't want any money uh, not to smoke. Anyway, you'll have your own examples. What factors determine whether transaction costs are high or low? Is the transaction about something that is one of a kind, unique? Or is it something that has lots of substitutes? In American law, we call such things fungible. Um, if there are lots of substitutes, as there are, for example, for a Diet Coke, we don't need to worry about transaction costs there. We'll just go to a closed substitute and buy one of those. The number of parties involved uh, can raise the transaction cost. If there are a lot of people who are going to be affected by the transaction, then they all have to consent, maybe. Uh, maybe they've adopted a, a, a decision rule that gives Hitesh the right to bargain on the behalf of all of the people in the, in the group. In that case, transaction costs might be low. But if there's no bargaining agent to, to, to stand in the shoes of all of the people affected by a transaction, transaction costs can be very high. Uh, and that presents an, what economists call a collective action uh, problem. A third element is the complexity of the transaction. Does it have a lot of steps that have to be completed? 
uh, in, in exactly the right order? Uh, does it involve a lot of suppliers who have to give you uh, things in order to complete the transaction? Uh, uh, and here's the most important thing. Does it take a lot of time to complete this transaction? Or is this something that can be done very, very quickly? If it can be done instantaneously, like I'd like a Diet Coke, here it is, that'll be a dollar, here's a dollar, you're done, it's gone. But many transactions like getting a degree in law or getting a degree in economics, that takes a lot of time. There are a lot of steps. The transaction cost can be very high uh, of informing each other about the steps that have to be completed, the things that you have to do in order to reach the end and get your degree. Uh, in those cases, transaction costs can be high. And one of the things Coase pointed out, uh, and, and later people drew attention to this, is the fact that the law can reduce those transaction costs uh, in complex situations. Uh, it can point out the complexity. Uh, it can point out the, 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 uh, uh, the steps that have to be completed. Uh, and finally, uh, a fourth element is the, the clarity of ownership claims involved. If the ownership claims involved are not clear, then one of the first things you have to determine is whether the person you're doing business with has a, a, a legally enforceable right to sell you the thing that you're trying to buy. Uh, usually we take that for granted, but uh, one of the things you learn from, from lawyers is that that is a risky assumption uh, to make. Uh, so next slide, please. All of this comes from a, one of the foundational articles uh, in Law and Economics, The Problem of Social Cost by Ronald A. Coase. It's a classic. And by that, I mean, everybody knows what's in it. Very few people have read it. That's what a classic is, is about. Uh, but I highly recommend you're getting a, a copy of that article <clears throat> and reading it. It's beautifully written, and it makes its points very, very clearly. Uh, okay, uh, let me give you one other example. Tort law, which we'll discuss on Wednesday, tort law exists precisely because of transaction costs. Tort law deals with accidents between strangers. Not always. Sometimes it deals with accidents between people who know each other, for example, a physician and his patient or her patient. But when you're driving an automobile and you get involved in an accident, the chances that you know the person that with whom you had the accident are very, very, very small. Tort law exists so that we do not have to engage in bargaining with every single person who might harm us. And they don't have to bargain with us about the, who's going to bear the cost uh, of an accidental encounter uh, with us. I'll elaborate on this on, on Wednesday, but it's one of the most powerful insights of law and economics into an area of the law. And that is the recognition, the transaction cost can be that the law, uh, tort law in particular, has found a way to, to deal with the fact that the transaction cost, the ex ante transaction cost between potential injurers and potential victims are so high that they cannot, they cannot bargain ex ante about who will bear responsibility in the event uh, that there's an, uh, an accident. Next slide, please. One of the most famous uh, examples of, of the use of transaction costs is this classic article from 1972 uh, by Guido Calabresi, the former dean of the uh, Yale Law School and also a, a judge uh, in the US federal uh, uh, system. And Douglas Melamed, one of his students from Harvard Law School, property rules, liability rules, and inalienability. I won't get a chance to talk about this in one of the most important aspects, and that's in, in uh, uh, contract law. Uh, in contract law, we, we can choose the remedy in the event that somebody has broken an enforceable promise. 
we can either specifically enforce that's called specific performance. We can specifically enforce the promise uh, that is compel the breacher to perform the promise that he or she said that they would do. Or we can simply say, uh, plaintiff, you're the victim of a breach, uh, will determine how much money uh, uh, compensates you for the loss of the performance and will assess damages against the defendant. Uh, the legal remedy is a direct court order, specific performance, for example, an injunction uh, of something. One of the insights of this article is to point out that we can choose between these remedies depending on the transaction costs of the parties. If the transaction costs are low, use a legal remedy. If the transaction costs are high, uh, assess damages. That's, uh, I'm sorry, that's a legal remedy. An equitable remedy is to be used when transaction costs are low. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to switch now, Hitesh, uh, to the second uh, uh, slideshow. Uh, the other tools that I, I talk about in the first slideshow uh, are, this is called Law and Social Norms, uh, Hitesh. Uh, the other things that I talk about in that first uh, introduction uh, are the tool of cost benefit analysis and the tool of um, uh, of game theory. I urge you to look at those if you're interested, and if you have questions, please feel free to ask me. Okay, law and social norms. Why are we talking uh, about this? This is one of the most important topics that law and economics gave birth to, and it is a recognition that there are other mechanisms in society that cause people to behave in, in a socially desirable fashion. Uh, the law is not operating al alone. One of the things that you learn if you go to law school is that the law is a tremendously important tool, but uh, the famous scholar Bob Ellickson, also at Yale Law School, called this view that law is the only or the very best tool to compel people to behave in a desirable fashion, legal centrism, that every, every problem has a legal solution. And one of the things he, he did so memorably for us is to point out that there are other uh, things that society has to induce people to behave in particular ways. Religion, for example, social norms. Social norms are unwritten rules that differ from society to society. In fact, they differ within a society in different locations and for different people of different ages and backgrounds. Uh, and, and Ellickson pointed out that that is a tremendously important tool in compelling people to behave in certain ways. And he, uh, next slide, Hitesh, he wrote a marvelous article that I've included in the materials, um, but I'll try to summarize very briefly for you. It's called Of Coast and Cattle. Uh, let me explain to you very briefly uh, how he came to do this research. At the time that uh, in the 1980s, uh, when this article was written, Bob Ellickson was a law professor at Stanford University. Uh, <clears throat> he had a student in his law and economics class who came up to him after his lecture about transaction costs and said, I have a very interesting example uh, for you uh, of transaction costs. This student came from a, a county in the far north of California, very rural county uh, and mountainous, I might add, called Shasta County. Uh, Shasta County is where the tallest mountain in California, uh, excuse me, uh, exists. It's over 10,000 feet tall. And this student said, uh, I've got a, here's the funny uh, example here. The Shasta County is a big county and the law about injuries in the event that uh, a cow is damaged by a car or a cow does damage to somebody's property. The law about those injuries from unsupervised cattle are different in the eastern half and the western half of Shasta County. And he said, how can this be? 
uh, in the eastern half, if a cow in, uh, interferes with somebody's property, uh, the, the cattle rancher is not liable to the property owner. In the western half, if a cow damages somebody's property, the cattle rancher is liable for the damage done by his uh, unsupervised cattle. How, do, how can this work? That there are two very different laws in one small place. Ellickson went to Shasta County and did a marvelous empirical investigation. He talked to lawyers and judges and insurance uh, brokers and, and police officers and lots of cattle ranchers and lots of people who were not cattle ranchers. And what he discovered was, even though the written law was different in the eastern half and the western half of, of Shasta County, the, the law, the behavior of people was identical uh, in the two halves. Uh, they, they complied with a social norm that said, be a good neighbor. And the understanding of what it meant to be a good neighbor was the same in the eastern and the western halves of Shasta County. Here's an example. If unsupervised cattle in the eastern half wandered onto somebody's property and destroyed some of the crops, the person whose crops were destroyed, destroyed went to the cattle, found out who owned them, called that person on the telephone, and said, your cattle are, are down here and they're, they're eating some of my corn. Uh, uh, I, can you come and get them? And uh, the owner would almost always say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, 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 I just turned them out into a public pasture and they must have wandered off uh, and, and, and injured you. And the, the, the first person whose crops were injured said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll get your cattle and put them in a, in a, sometimes in the garage of a house. I'll keep them and feed them until you can get here. And the, the cattle rancher would very frequently said, say, that's very kind of you. How much do I owe you? And the other person would say, don't worry about it. Uh, just come and get your cattle as soon as you can. In the other half of the county uh, where the cattle rancher uh, could be liable uh, in the event that the damage occurred. Exactly the same thing happened. If cattle wandered into people's property and caused damage, the person who was damaged called the cattle owner and said, I've got your cattle here. They were eating up my, my vegetables. Uh, can you come and get them? And the person would hurry to get uh, their uh, cow and they would offer to pay and the person would almost always say, no, don't worry about it, it's not important. So the actual behavior in the two halves of, of, uh, of Shasta County was identical. People were conforming their behavior to a social norm, not to the law. That's the important point. And they, they all knew what the social norm was, be a good neighbor. The cattle ranchers should try to supervise uh, their uh, cattle, uh, and the other person should try to minimize the damage, perhaps by building fences. But there was no legal involvement uh, in this, with one exception. And this is a marvelous, a marvelous discovery. Uh, a lot of people from the state of Colorado, which is uh, a thousand miles to the east of California, moved to Shasta County to start cattle ranches or to start uh, ranches growing crops. They came from a different social uh, uh, norm and they thought that not knowing the social norm in Shasta County, they consulted the law. And so they were very quick to sue people if cattle caused them damage or to be sued, uh, the cattle rancher was uh, sued by people who thought that they'd suffered an injury. One of the things Ellickson says in this fascinating article is when people come into the, uh, uh, the society that has clear norms, they don't know what the norms are. And if they don't know what the norms are, that's when they consult the law. 
But if they know the social norms, the social norms are the things that guide their behavior. Uh, next slide, uh, Hitesh. The point that uh, that this leads to is, I'm sorry, uh, slide number eight. Uh, the point that this all leads to uh, is that we have to remember that we're dealing with a very complex societal uh, situation when we talk about the law. Uh, we may think that people want to inform themselves about the law, and once they understand the law, they may have to consult a lawyer. They, they seek to conform their behavior to it. But if, if not, uh, if they don't care about the law, if the thing that really motivates them are social norms, uh, then we need to know what the social norms are. And here's an important point. We need to know the interaction that exists between legal rules and sanctions and social norms and their sanctions. Uh, it's a very important thing for us to bear in mind as we go through uh, the rest of the week. Here are some questions that arise. I'll just point them to you, uh, point them out to you. Uh, since Ellickson's article in 1986, there's been an awful lot of work uh, <clears throat> to try to establish uh, what the relationship is between law and social norms uh, and how do social norms change. There is no legislature, there is no set of judges who decides on social norms. How do they change? And heaven knows they change. Uh, but how does that happen? Uh, one of the most important insights there was that of Cass Sunstein uh, at, at Harvard Law School, who said that social norms frequently change if there's a norm entrepreneur, an entrepreneur in, uh, who is not interested in founding a company, but in changing the social norms uh, in his uh, society. Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to say about law and social norms. Um, I give you at the end of this uh, presentation, there are some additional uh, resources for you to read about uh, the application. There we go. Uh, the application of, of, the, uh, of the insight about social norms and the reaction with the law. Finally, let's turn to the last slide sh uh, show. Hitesh, this is the limits of markets. Uh, the, 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 the subject I'm going to discuss here is, is uh, related to what I've talked about heretofore. Uh, I've pointed out to you uh, that transaction costs are, are one of the most important tools that economists can give to lawyers to talk about legal issues. Uh, and, and, and Coase explicitly meant this uh, uh, insight to guide us in deciding, can the market solve this problem or do we need to intervene because the market cannot solve this because of transaction costs? So uh, that the limitation of markets and the need for legal or social norm or other uh, uh, solutions to social problems is one of the great takeaways from the discovery of transaction costs. But there's more. Uh, I included this fascinating uh, article by Yuri Ganesi and Aldo Rusticini called A Fine as a Price. Let me explain what this is about and, and why it's important. And then we'll discuss a couple of other short examples, and then I'll stop uh, and answer uh, your questions uh, if, if I can. Um, uh, Ganesi and Rusticini. Ganesi is from Israel, and so he knew about this example. It's an empirical study of daycare centers in Haifa, a large city in northern uh, Israel, where I taught several times and had a marvelous uh, experience. Um, in those daycare centers, people with small children who were not ready for school yet would drop their children off at the daycare center early in the morning. The parents would go to work. The children would be with other children supervised by uh, adults. And the parents were supposed to pick their children up by a specific time in the afternoon. Let us assume 
they were supposed to pick them up by five o'clock in the afternoon. There was a fee, of course, uh, for using the services of the daycare center, but presumably that's people were perfectly happy to pay that price. But one of the things that happened uh, that the daycare centers didn't know how to deal with was that some parents were late in picking up their children. Instead of arriving before five, they wouldn't get there till 5.15 or 5.30 or even six o'clock. And the issue was what to do about this. Uh, it's costly to the daycare center to, to deal with late, uh, with parents who arrive late. Uh, they have to keep the staff there uh, and they have therefore have to keep the staff, uh, they have to compensate the staff for remaining longer. The, the, what Ganesi and Rostaccini discovered was that the way that the daycare centers dealt with this issue was by asking the parents not to be late, just asking them. But then uh, Ganesi and Rostaccini came on the scene and they tried an experiment. And the experiment was to divide the number of daycare centers, there were a lot of them, uh, into three groups. One group, uh, uh, the parents were told, please don't be late. The second group, the parents uh, were told, uh, uh, we're going to charge you a fee if you're more than 10 minutes late in picking up your child. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, there were just two groups, not three groups, or maybe there were three groups, I can't remember, but they're two important groups for us. One group, uh, where there was just a, a social norm attempt to, to get people not to disobey the, the rule of pick your children up by five. And another group in which uh, there was a fine uh, that was imposed on people who were late for picking up their children. What happened? Did the amount of lateness go down in both circumstances? No, it didn't. Uh, in, the, in the group who charged a fee for the students or for the uh, parents who didn't come before five, 10 minutes after five, and it was an increasing fine. In that group, the amount of lateness actually increased. Now, why is that? And, and think about what a, an odd finding this is. It's an odd finding because we think that if we impose a price, people will do less of that uh, activity. In this case, we imposed a price for being late and people paid the fine and did more of the activity that was the cause of imposing the, the fine for being late. Why is that? Well, uh, as, uh, as Rust uh, Ganesi and Rusticini pointed out, people perceive that not as a fine, but just as a price. There's a price now for being late we're willing to pay that price, so we'll be late. There was more lateness because it was it was uh, a price was attached to it. Not what we expect to happen, we economists, uh, and yet a very important thing to recognize: people may perceive a sanction, for example, the payment of money damages for doing something, as a price. And, and they're willing to pay that price uh, to invade somebody's property, to breach a contract, uh, to, to engage in an accident by driving too fast. Uh, we have to worry about these things too uh, if we're using economics to think about how people behave. The rest of this uh, slide uh, show uh, is based, uh, on, go to slide three, please, or, or four, I guess. Uh, is based on a, a book that I can't recommend highly enough. Uh, it's by a political scientist who teaches at Harvard and, and whose classes, by the way, are available online. Uh, his class on justice is absolutely marvelous. Uh, it's had millions and millions of viewers, and I highly recommend it. For our purposes today, I can very highly recommend this book what money can't buy, the moral limits of markets. And, and just consider these examples here. Uh, in Santa Ana, California, 
uh, uh, close to Los Angeles. You, if you violate the law and have to go to jail, you can pay $82 a night, roughly the cost of a motel room, to get a better cell in the prison or in the jail. What? Uh, how can this be? Is this the sort of thing we really want to do? We want to charge people prices uh, for occupying the nice cells? Uh, in, in most cities in the United States, we have what are called HOV, high occupancy vehicle uh, lanes, to try to decongest uh, the traffic. A high occupancy, high HOV, a high occupancy, occupancy vehicle is one that has two or more people in it. And if you if you have a high occupancy vehicle, you can be in a special lane that typically goes much faster uh, than the lanes where there's only one person in the car. However, <laughs> people who don't have two people in the car want to get into the high occupancy vehicle lane, can they pay a fee to do that? Yes, you can. Uh, in Minneapolis, in San Francisco, uh, in uh, New York City, and other places, you can pay a fee, even though there's only one person in the car, to use the high HOV lanes uh, that allow you to go faster. Um, in, uh, in Canada, and in, now in the United States, you can buy the right to emigrate into Canada or the United States. Uh, there are usually conditions uh, on that, but uh, you have to uh, create 10 jobs in a high unemployment area. Uh, but if you will, are willing to do that and pay $500,000, you can immigrate into the United States. It's not clear that these are great. These are good, good things to to use the market uh, to solve. There are other examples in this slideshow, uh, but I, if if you would uh, hit text, go to the the very final one. I think it's slide nineteen. Uh, um, uh, one of the things that that Sandel's marvelous book causes us. Uh, to think about is what things ought not to be solved by the market? What things ought to be solved by explicit laws that require or forbid certain sorts of things? Um, and, and one of the thoughts I want to leave you with and then answer any questions you might have is this marvelous quotation from Kenneth Arrow. As, as many of you know who studied economics, Kenneth Arrow was a giant uh, in, in modern microeconomics. Uh, I had the great fortune, good fortune to have him as one of my instructors uh, in graduate school. He was a, a remarkably intelligent, thoughtful uh, man, but an incredible uh, developer of the mathematics of, of uh, microeconomic concepts. And one of the things Arrow said when we talked in our classes about the limits of markets uh, was there are limitations on, on using morality or ethics uh, against self-interest. Uh, it's best, he says, that the requirement of ethical behavior be confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down. We do not wish to use up recklessly the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. It's a great observation. And here's an example uh, of it. Um, we want people to be charitable. We want people who have money, and even those who don't have very much money, to, to get a, a good feeling from donating money to worthy causes. Uh, that's altruism. How should we encourage that? Should we leave that to the, the churches and other religious uh, guidances? Should we leave that to what mothers and fathers teach their children? Or should we encourage it through the tax system? Should we give people a tax incentive 
for the, the charitable donations that they give. Well, then if we do, and people increase their donations, it's good that the donations increase, but did they increase because of people's warm feeling of altruism, a moral good feeling, or because we gave them a tax incentive to do so? Those are the sort of things I think that modern law and economics needs to think about in the back of our mind when we talk about the legal solution uh, for societal problems. Okay, it's 834 here in Champaign. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Can I access uh, the questions, uh, Hitesh, are they, are they here somewhere? They are in the chat section. Uh, the chat section, where's that? Oh no, not there. There is one question. Okay. Uh, how about this? I'm sorry, I don't see the chat section. Partic oh, here it is, here it is, I thought. Uh, from Dr. Shaohan, uh, I think recurrence of these social nuisances made them to resort to go to law. I agree with you. That's a really good uh, point. If people are violating the social norms repeatedly, then people go to the law uh, for their for their solution. Um, and that raises one of the most important points I, I, I outlined in that uh, presentation at the end of the presentation. Uh, one of the best uses of the law is to solve what are called end game problems. Uh, people are engaged in, in interactions, which are very often productively looked at uh, 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 through the tool of game theory, but sometimes they can't find their own solution to the problems. And rather than have them resort to violence, we don't want that to happen. We can step into the situation and impose a legal uh, setting. That's what happened in the United States in the 1960s and 70s in the southern United States, where there was rampant uh, discrimination against Black people. Uh, there was violence between Blacks and whites, and, and no social norm could seem to solve that problem. So the law had to step in and provide a solution. Uh, that's, those are obvious examples, uh, Dr. Chahan, but I hope that you and others in this class are thinking about, can I articulate a reason or a, a theory or a model of the circumstances in which social norms are not going to work and why they're not going to work uh, so that we can identify those situations ex ante? Okay. Any other questions? Can I sir, ask one question, sir? Sure, please. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, but like whether you you are concluding in this way that uh, generally law and economics was developed based on the market-based principle, and uh, uh, putting price, yeah, putting cost, yeah, putting uh, market denominator terms has slowly, gradually. From the repeated game theory point of view, from the consequences point of view, people were people were knowing about what will be the consequences and what is the cost. In that, uh, uh, the system is going towards the something where the ethical value, yeah, social norms, yeah, the normal humanness is uh, somehow somewhere uh, going in a different uh, level. That's what. Uh, Am I correctly concluding that uh, you have something else to, to add, sir? No, I think that's exactly right. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I would make this, this brief observation. I hope it's brief. Uh, uh, my, my sense is, from my many years on this planet, uh, uh, is that uh, social norms are a very, very powerful motivation for the vast majority of people. Uh, in deciding what to do, uh, and um, it's it, it's it's in rare circumstances 
like the one Dr. Uh, Chauhan asked me to, to talk about. Very rare circumstances where social norms break down completely. And instead of chaos, we hope we have a legal solution uh, to those uh, circumstances. But that raises the question of why do social norms break down? I don't, in what circumstances do social norms not guide people? Well, one last thought I wanted to say, and you didn't make this point, Hitesh, but you hinted at it. Um, most people don't know what the law is. Uh, lawyers do, but but most non-lawyers don't know about the law. They they don't know about the institutions, how they work, uh, and and they don't know what they're getting into when they decide to appeal to the law for a solution to their problems. Uh, I once had a, a neighbor who turned out to be a very, very good friend who, when he first uh, came uh, to live next to me, uh, was was very upset about uh, where the property line was between his property and my property. Uh, and instead of instead of coming and knocking on my door and, and using social norms by saying, you know, I think that the property line is different than you do. Uh, and can we work something out? Uh, I got a I got a phone call from his lawyer uh, uh, about uh, this issue. Uh, and at that point, I felt very differently about the, the controversy than I would if he had used social norms. Because when you invoke the law, you very often have, have increase the 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 uh, anxiety of the situation uh, you know uh, uh, our very my favorite United States president a wonderful wonderful man named Abraham Lincoln once said uh, you can catch more flies with a small amount of honey than with a bucket of vinegar uh, and what he what he meant to indicate was being kind and sweet serves you much better than being sour uh, and resorting to the law too soon. It's a wonderful, wonderful expression. Thank you, sir. Prati, do you have a question you can unmute and ask? Sir, uh, you, uh, there was a quotation that you shared uh, which said uh, about breakdown of price system, sir. Can you yeah. uh, give an example or throw some light on what would uh, qualify as a breakdown of price system? There was an example of uh, surrogacy uh, on that slide. So would we say that surrogacy per se would be a breakdown of price system because of ethical angles involved? Great example and, and great question. Um, that example, I included because Michael Sandel, who I, for whom I have the greatest uh, respect, gave that example in his book. He didn't think that paying for another person to, to bear your child uh, to term, as we say, uh, was, was a, a legitimate use of the price system. I question that, and I think you may too. I think it might be a perfectly legitimate uh, use of the price system. I don't think that's that's a moral infraction uh, at all. Uh, it seems to me that everybody involved, including the child, is benefited by this transaction. So I, I, if, if we had had time, I would have made this the point that you've just asked about, that, that some of the examples that uh, um, uh, Sandell gives, I don't think illustrate his point very well. Some do. I think that charging $82 a night, uh, if you'd like to have a private cell in a jail, uh, that sounds outrageous to me. But paying somebody else uh, to bear your, ch your child to term, that doesn't sound awful to me. Frankly, by the way, it doesn't sound awful to me to pay $8 a day for a person to have use to the high HOV lanes, the fast moving lanes. Uh, I, I don't find that to be a misuse of the price system either. Uh, uh, there are other examples we didn't get to that, that strike me as on the edge. 
One of them has to do with a young woman in the state of Utah who is a single mother and had a, a child who had special needs. Uh, he was mentally disabled and he needed to go to a special school. She couldn't afford to do that. But somebody offered to pay for her enough money to allow her child to go to school if she would put an advertisement as a tattoo on her forehead. And the, the, the tattoo was an advertisement for an airline. Uh, and and she got paid enough for, she did it. And she got paid enough for her child to go to uh, to the school. I found that to be just, I, it, that's on the borderline for me. Um, I don't, I don't think a mother who has special needs ought to have to re, to do that sort of thing to get help. Uh, there's a better way to do this, uh, and and maybe the responsibility falls on all of us through the tax system to give her the money to have her child appropriately educated, and and having her have to. It's a permanent tattoo she can't get rid of. That's that's horrible, I think. Uh, but my students, this was interesting. My students thought that every one of the examples that sent out him that I would like because I'm an economist, but I was trying to get them to see that some of these examples are horrible uses of the market system. Others, not so bad. And so, for example, the one you pointed out, the surrogacy, I find that perfectly legitimate. I'm sorry, I, go, I went on for too long. Thank you, thank you, sir. Akshay, sir, you have some question. Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Thank you very much for this enlightening talk, sir. So my question to you, since you mentioned the discrimination of blacks in 1960s United States, so as you may be aware, the heart of Atlanta Motel versus USA 1964 judgment, now, that judgment came into existence due to the economics, because the heart of Atlanta motel was a motel situated at the interstate and whereon the jurisdiction of law was invoked that whether the Congress has the authority or has the jurisdiction per se to invoke in regulating trade and commerce. So my question to you is, sir, is are the limitations of law and social norms always rooted in economics? Because based on this example, and also the example of the cattle ranchers you gave in the state of California. I hope my question is clear, sir. Oh, it is. It's an, and it's a fabulous question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, let me just say a couple of things about this. Um, I think your example uh, and our ongoing issues of, about discrimination um, of, of blacks by whites has been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, in 1865, uh, in the United States, as you know, uh, the Congress passed the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, slavery in the United States. Uh, that law did, I mean, I find that to be a marvelous and wonderful thing. To, no, no society, I'm, I, I, I'm, I want to be cautious about this. I dislike slavery and I think it's a bad thing and I'm glad it's outlawed. And I think it should be outlawed everywhere. However, I think one of the points you're, you're, you're making is an extraordinarily good one. And that is that even something like a, 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 a constitutional uh, declaration about what is right and wrong. And then as you rightly pointed out, the 1964 judgments by the United States Supreme Court those haven't changed a lot of behavior. Uh, and that's partly because what needs to change is not so much the law, but rather the hearts and minds of the people involved. Uh, and, and that's the difficult thing to figure out a way to, to do. I'm happy that there's a law against discrimination because uh, that there is, there is a, a we don't want people to discriminate. And even if they're intent on discriminating, at least they'll realize it's illegal and they shouldn't do it. And if they're caught and sanctioned, it could be very costly to them. I think that's great. 
uh, I'm not sure that will change the hearts and minds, but over time, the social norms need to change. Uh, before the 1964 judgment and after, there were social norms that white people had that um, made them reluctant to do business with black people made them reluctant to engage in social interactions, uh, uh, reluctant to engage in things beyond uh, employment relations. Those things need to change. And, and one of the ways they change is through changing social norms. How do those social norms change? We, we don't have a good model of that. We really don't understand that very well. I strongly suspect that there may be changes, legal changes, uh, that can cause this. For example, uh, creating situations in which blacks and whites interact more has a tremendous Im important uh, role in changing social norms. So the many laws that we have that, for, that, that call for blacks and whites to, to be educated together in the public schools, and if, if there's geographical sorting so that people go to black schools and people go to white schools, depending on where they live, let's have them mix and mingle. And if that happens, it's all good. It can be good. If there's housing discrimination, let's forbid that so that blacks and whites are neighbors. And uh, uh, if they're neighbors, they'll realize that these people are just people like you and me. And that's good, um, but it's it's a long process. Uh, I went all my life. I went to gr uh, uh, grade school and high school um, with um, um, blacks. I played basketball with them. I interacted with them. We went to parties together. We did things together. But after high school, when I got to college and graduate school, and then became a professor my interactions with black people became very rare. And I dislike that. Uh, and, and therefore, how do we increase that? I think affirmative action is a, uh, a, an important social tool to cause these social norms to change. Whether they're effective, I don't know, but it, it and that's something we need to know. But it's a great question, thank you. Uh, sir, sir, just to add on to that, you've answered my question any satisfactorily, but my question was that are these rooted in economics? Because the 1964 judgment was also because of economics and the example that you gave of cattle ranchers. Because maybe the ranchers wanted to avoid the legal costs, so maybe they had a social contract within themselves. So, uh, I mean, could you elaborate on that, sir? Um, I, I, I can't do that very well, but because it's such a good question. And it pushes me beyond the things I know about. Now, usually, having made that statement, I'll then talk for 15 minutes. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> it's such a good question. And I agree that it's a very important question that uh, the costs and the benefits and how they're distributed and who bears them are tremendous. They're always tremendously important questions. I don't, I don't no know. Problem. Thanks, no sir. problem. You can answer that anytime. Thank you. Neha, you have any question? The last question, and then we can conclude. So, can uh, if there are no question, can uh, yeah, Drew want to ask? So, last question, Drew. Yeah, just be brief. Yeah, uh, sir, it was given in a fine is a price. Uh, that it is important to recall that economic analysis of the effect of a punishment on behavior is not direct and requires instead a complete specification of market forces. Can you yes. please elaborate that a bit? Oh, I wish somebody would ask an easy question, but easy questions are not, not fun. These are good questions. You know, I think one of the things I always ask my students to think about is in the situation of the Ghanesian Rustichini uh, argument, um, was the what's the price charged to the parents who who didn't come? Was the price too low? 
I, I, if that's the thrust of your question, I agree with it entirely. Making the price, making the sanction high enough is key. Uh, and, and in the uh, in the article, I think Anisi and Rostaccini raised this point. Uh, it wasn't a very high sanction. Uh, it's very modest. Uh, and I think any economist, including Ganesi and Rostaccini, who are superb economists, would say the price wasn't high enough. If it was, it was, if it was much higher, parents would have behaved differently. Same thing is true in, in criminal law and in anything else, too. Uh, we've got to set the price correctly. So, if, if there are no questions, I think I request Anita, Madam, to say a few words and we can then conclude the session. Uh, Dr. Thakkar, can you, will you permit me some questions, please? I think that would be more. Yeah, yeah, either question, yeah, either concluding. <laughs> uh, Professor Ulan, yeah. every time we attend your session, we just learn more and more. <laughs> and like I said, that from day one, you know, at least you'll have one serious student. <laughs> so that's been so many years. So what came to my mind is this. Um, according to course, we say transaction law can reduce transaction costs, you know, to make everyone better off. Wouldn't we correct that in the face of uh, subprime crisis, asset price bubbles, and so on and so forth, if we trace all of that, would it be all right to argue that uh, the transaction costs, especially in um, business laws, have been made so low that it's created inefficient outcomes, as we see, you know, uh, when the bubbles burst? Can it be attributed to the law uh, going too low on the transaction cost part? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know enough to. to to speak a long time about that, but I recognize the point you're making and it's a very good one. Sometimes uh, uh, we make the transaction costs so low that uh, the results are, are not desirable. I think that's part of what you're saying. Uh, I think a related point to this, and I'll just make the point and then, then uh, stop because I need to think more about what you've said. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, a tool that, that economics can provide for the law uh, is to recognize that there are social costs. That was, after all, the title of, of Coase's marvelous article, the problem of social costs. That is, what do we do about the fact that sometimes maximizing private utility or private profit has a social cost to it. Other people are paying a cost. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's one of the great things that we can, we can focus our attention on. Uh, uh, and I'll try to bring this up in the property and, and torts and crime section that when, when, when the benefits and the costs of activities, uh, partially accrue to other people, we need to be mindful of that and find ways to get private actors to take those social costs uh, into account. And we certainly didn't do that well in the uh, <clears throat> financial uh, regulations, the easing of financial regulations in the late 1990s uh, and in the early decade, early years of this century. Uh, we, we focused too much on the private benefits uh, and ignored the social costs of some of the financial innovations that occurred. And also, sir, uh, <clears throat> social norm vis-a-vis -vis the law. Um, would we not say that both have a circular cause and effect kind of a, you know, motion? You know? That's right. I think that's right. You mean that social norms cause laws and laws cause social norms to change. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that may be one of the, that may be one of the powerful things that that uh, the law can do. I, I didn't I didn't mention that, and 
Ellickson doesn't either. Uh, but there are certain circumstances uh, in which the law creates the social norms uh, to behave in a way that we want that that that, that motivated uh, the enactment of the law. Uh, and if it does so, then uh, social norms and law are working together, which I think is a great. Uh, uh, that's the best of all situations. The situations that that many of the questions envisioned were where law was pushing this way and social norms were pushing that way. And how do we get them so that they're both working together? And I think your point's an extraordinarily good one. It, it recognizes that sometimes social norms change just because the law changes. Um, which and, I, and, and maybe many a time that's not good. That, that's, a, that's exactly right. That's and, then you need, and then you need another law to bring back those social norms. I mean, well, I, right. And, and I, I, I don't, I, I'd like to think about the circumstances uh, in which law has created social norms. Uh, and I'd like to think about circumstances in which social norms were bad, as in the South and in the United States. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, and how, how those how we get those social norms to change. That's what I, in one of the questions uh, that I think Akshay was asking, uh, how do we get the law to get social norms to change? So we can get a social norm to change maybe by, and uh, you know, because, because social norms are primarily economic constructs. Yes, yes, yes. So if and we change. But then you get the problem that I, I, I hinted at uh, in one of my last comments was that People, uh, you know, donations to charitable organizations increase, but is that because people became more generous? Uh, they cut back on their own consumption in order to give money to people who are in needy circumstances, or are they just doing it because it gives them a tax break? Their arts haven't changed, but they're, they're, they're induced to behave in a good way by the tax law. It's not that important to me uh, I would rather people be motivated by by thoughts of charity and the like, but if the law can get them to behave as if they were motivated by a social norm of being generous, that's a good second best. And there is so much to sir, discuss on this, and Hitesh sir has already said that the uh, like, last question. But there, there are studies also, isn't it, which has said that uh, if you give these kind of incentives, then actually altruistic behavior reduces because yeah. that distinction does not remain. No, I know, I know. And so, so, I'll give you another example of this. This is a great example. Um, what should we do about people who engage in heroic acts? Uh, there's a very famous example of an airplane disaster in Washington, D.C. A plane crashed into the Potomac River uh, and it, it, it wasn't sinking immediately. It was floating on the on the river. This was in the winter when the temperatures are very cold. The water is very cold. There were people on the bank of the river who dove into the river to try to save some of the people who were injured and unconscious in the water and would have died. Should we encourage uh, heroism uh, in some legal way? Or is that just, is that behavior better encouraged just by social norms? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know how I feel about this, but I like the fact that somebody who does heroic things is, they're not rewarded by money. They're not rewarded by a medal. They're they're rewarded by the inner the inner feeling of I did something selfless. I risked my life to help somebody else live. I wish you know, I, I don't know that that leads to let me put it this way. I'm an economist. I'm not sure that leads to the optimal amount of heroism. And there are situations, we had one that's, uh, one of these last year in the United States where a, a, a madman with a gun went into a school and started shooting, killed a lot of children. 
and the police didn't do anything. They stood and watched and tried to put down your gun. They, they just tried to get the guy to behave rather than doing something heroic. Wish they had. I think they were expected to. <laughs> but I don't know. It's a, you're right. We could talk about this uh, until breakfast time tomorrow. <laughs> so, Professor, there's an inverse relationship between the price system and 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 heroism and all those impossibly, you know, monetary traits which are impossible to monetize. So, there's an inverse relationship between the two. It comes out like that. I agree. And there's circumstances. This is part of uh, Sandel's wonderful thing. There are circumstances in which monetizing something strikes us as morally morally bad. Um, um, one of the examples he gives is uh, <laughs> uh, taking out an insurance policy on the life of someone else. There were people who recognized that that, that was a profit opportunity. Uh, and, and the way they the way they did this was they invited a lot of older people to join them on a, a cruise through the Caribbean from Florida. There are a lot of older people in Florida because the, the weather's nice. So a lot of older people took this free cruise around the Caribbean, and, but they were required to have a medical examination on the ship. And if they um, if they pass the medical examination, the people who organized the cruise took out a life insurance policy on those people, not on themselves, on the older people on the boat. Does that sound to you like a a, a good profit opportunity? Let's find a lot of older people, some of whom are going to get sick and die soon. Let's get insurance policies on them. So that if they die, we get some money. I don't understand it. I do understand somebody having an insurance policy on what is called a key man or a key woman. In some enterprises, there are some employees who are thought to be so important that if they die or leave or try to retire, it will cost the enterprise a lot of money. In those circumstances, many of corporations in the United States gets what, get what is known as key man or key woman insurance. Uh, uh, so that if something should happen to this person, the, the corporation will be compensated so that they can look for a replacement. I, there's nothing wrong in, to, uh, I don't find that any, nothing wrong with that. But there are other examples in the Sandel book that I, I I urge you to look at because they're just they're just wonderful. Can I say one line? Sure. So what I feel the heroism is like uh, the like what, what you are doing, sir. You are wake up at early at seven thirty, and you are taking session not from today. I think from since from uh, two thousand ten onwards. So from last twelve years, what you are doing that is a heroism. And I think uh, with that, uh, I think here the colleagues and whatever the what uh, the you are giving to the uh, not GNL but for India for law and economics, I think that is the great. And I think I don't know whether it is a mark. I don't think this is happening due to market-based principles. <laughs> this no. is happening something which is beyond uh, the market understanding. I think in that regard, I think uh, if everybody agree, we can uh, <laughs> conclude and we will meet tomorrow. I appreciate that, and and I don't want. I, I, there is an altruistic element to this, I, uh, but there is also for me the great pleasure of talking about a subject I love, uh, and interacting with very intelligent people about about these issues. I just think it's that gives me great pleasure, and I, I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to talk with all of these wonderful people, uh, and I look forward to talking with you all tomorrow. Two.